Good evening, everyone, and thank you for attending AACP's webinar with Dr. Jim McKee presenting the forgotten tissue, the TM joint. I'm Shaylin, the Association Manager for the AACP, and I will be the host of the webinar tonight. This webinar is approximately 50 minutes, followed by a 10-minute Q&A session. Please enter any questions you have in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and we will address them at the end of the presentation. No conflicts of interest have been disclosed by Dr. McKee or the AACP. Registrants can expect to receive a recording of the presentation via email within seven to 10 business days, and AACP members attending live will receive their CE certificate of attendance within 30 days of the webinar air date. I would like to mention a couple of upcoming events for the AACP. Our next complimentary webinar will be brought to you in part by SPP Partners on October 10th with Dr. Weston Spencer and VP of Partnerships, Brian Gibby, presenting how to compete against a DSO. Also join us in Milwaukee, Wisconsin for AACP's workshop, Bio Research, The Power in Your Hands. This course will review treatment that can be done with a laser including using fractional laser therapy for snoring in airway challenged patients, surgical applications like phrenectomies and tongue ties, periodontal applications, both surgical and non-surgical, and TMD regenerative procedures. I would like to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Jim McKee. Dr. McKee is in private practice in Downers Grove, Illinois. He has a restoratively based practice with an emphasis on occlusion and TMJ disorders. In addition to his practice, Dr. McKee is a published author who has lectured nationally and internationally for over 25 years. He is a resident faculty member at Spear Education in Scottsdale, Arizona, and he is also a past president of the American Academy of Restorative Dentistry and the American Equilibration Society. Welcome, Dr. McKee. Okay, thank you so much. It's truly a pleasure to be here. All right, let's get started tonight. I'm gonna to thank the AACP for the invitation to be here tonight. It's always a treat to speak to this great group. Uh, Dan Clower, my good friend and I have really talked a lot about these issues over the years. So the title of tonight's program is The Forgotten Tissue, The Disc in the Temporomandibular Joint. You know, it's interesting because when I talk about this to dentists, this is a very common response that I get. I don't treat TMD patients. Why do I need to know about the disc? The assumption that those dentists are making is that my patients have jo normal joint anatomy. So let's start with what normal joint anatomy is. If it's a structurally intact joint, here's a CBCT of normal anatomy, lateral towards the outside, medial towards the brain, and as we look at the condyle in red and joint socket in yellow, we can kind of get an idea of normal anatomy. Let's pair that up with the MRI coronal view, same orientation. Lateral pole is the pole you can feel when you open and close. Medial pole is about 20 millimeters in. We don't hear a lot about lateral and medial. We're going to talk a little bit more about that tonight than we normally do. Condyle in red, joint socket in yellow, disc in blue. Let's switch to the more common view, the sagittal view, anterior posterior orientation here, condyle in red, joint socket in yellow. And now as we look at the MRI sagittal view, we can see the same structures with the disc highlighted in blue. Now, when you look at these, easy for a CBCT to see the bone, but we don't see the disc very well because it only picks up hard tissue. So what you have to do is kind of read the joint space. Now, in order to do that, we do want to take the CBCT in a skeletal position with the condyle in a superior position in the joint socket so we can get an idea of disc position. Normal soft tissue disc position, we're going to have an 11 o'clock load-bearing area, which is going to put us about a 1 o'clock posterior attachment. For those of you who might be literature buffs, you're going to say, in the literature, it says 12 o'clock. True. What it says though in the literature is 12 o'clock plus or minus 10 degrees in 1990 by Drace. In 1997 by Ramelsburg, it was 12 o'clock plus or minus 30 degrees. When you have that big of variation, we know that we really don't know what normal is. In 2012, 
little over 10 years ago, Provenzano did a nice job really articulating what we need to be thinking about and the fact that the disc is a load bearing surface. And in order to carry the load, it has to be at about the 11 o'clock position. That's gonna put the posterior band, as I said, closer to one o'clock, but that makes sense. We wanna make sure that soft tissue wraps the hard tissue or the condyle so it can be protected in all movements. And not only does the condyle protect, or not only does the disc protect the condyle, don't forget it also protects the joint socket. We'll look at a couple of joint socket cases in a little bit. In order to have this, we're gonna have an intact ligament at the lateral pole and the medial pole. Normal heart tissue, condyle is gonna be about eight millimeters anterior to posterior and should fill about two thirds of the joint socket. Condyle is gonna be about 20 millimeters medial to lateral. It's gonna be centered in the joint socket from an orthopedic perspective. We're gonna have a normal marrow space, normal blood flow inside the condyle. And we're gonna have an intact cortical plate. Think of the condyle like an M&M, hard shell outside, softer inside. We don't want that hard shell cracked, broken, with chunks out of it, eroded. We want that to be a solid bone because that's gonna be the load bearing area in the joint. If we have normal growth, we have normal joint vertical dimension. Vertical dimension is made up of the hard tissue, the ramus length. It's gonna be about a 60 to 75 millimeter range. 65-ish is gonna be probably normal. And the disc is about two millimeters thick. If we have this, we're likely going to have enough mandibular projection to get a class one occlusion. Just keep an eye on that point. We'll come back to that. A couple things to understand. The medial pole is the load-bearing part of the joint due to the anatomy, primarily in the joint socket. The muscles are positioned between the teeth and the joints. The load is going to be distributed between the teeth and the joints. At the tooth level, we want even contact to distribute the load along all the teeth as evenly as possible. At the joint level, we want to distribute it through the medial pole because that's where there's dense bone to be able to dissipate the load. Second thing to understand is think of the disc as a gasket, a soft tissue three-dimensional positioning tool that positions the condyle in the joint socket. So now when we close, we have a repeatable occlusion that we can build to. You know, again, I do a lot of TMD, but I'm primarily a restorative dentist. And really the way I got into this is because I had cases that weren't stable from an occlusal perspective. At that time, my definition of occlusion was how the teeth fit. Today, my definition of occlusion is not only how the teeth fit, but also how the joints fit as well. So the disc, the soft tissue with the medial pole maintains the vertical dimension at the joint level. Now, I'll also hear from dentists, you know, I don't treat TMJ patients. Why don't we need to know about the disc? The assumption is TMD patients present with pain. That's not always gonna be true. It's gonna be true sometimes. Let's take a look at this case. Pain in the right joint, average pain of four out of 10, worst eight out of 10. If we look at the bone, all of a sudden now we see pretty significant changes, not only in the right joint, but also in the left joint. If you look at the left joint, you can see if you look at the lateral pole, that's just about bone against bone, but go back to the right joint. The condyle is smaller. We don't have an intact cortical plate going around the outer edges of the bone. So all of a sudden now, we have some compromised bone. Interestingly, you know, we were taught that the problems were primarily muscular in nature. That was before we had three-dimensional imaging. Today, we know there are a lot more cases with structural changes at the joint level besides the muscle aspect that invariably goes along with that. Here's the MRI in, these case, in this case. You can see now the left joint has a really distorted configuration and shape from years of adaptation. The white area in front of the blue disc is swelling, so you've got some effusion in that area, which correlates to pain. Again, if we look at the left side, the joint, the disc is displaced as well. You know, it's really rare to see one side normal and one side displaced. If one side's displaced, it's almost I don't want to say for sure, but it's a really high percentage that the other side is going to have a displacement as well. And when you start to take a look at this case, we get an idea of ramus length deficiencies, 51 on one side, 55 on the other. When we talk about vertical dimension at the tooth level, we get nervous about opening the bite one, two, three millimeters to have enough room to put a crown in. 
all of a sudden now we're losing double digits of vertical dimension at the joint level. But let me rephrase that because we're really not losing it. I really believe we're never getting it. We always talk about a loss of vertical dimension at the joint level. I think we, we need to have talk about this in a new way. It's not that we're losing vertical dimension at the joint level. We're failing to achieve normal vertical dimension. So many of these cases are the result of the disc coming off the bone in the growing patient and the ramus length never developing to full genetic potential. It's not like this patient lost 14 millimeters on the right side and 10 millimeters on the left side. They didn't grow and then wear it away. They never had it. That's the problem. So the typical question is, where can I send this patient? I'm going to tell you, why don't you be the person in your community who takes care of this patient? There are so many of these patients in our neighborhoods, and they're all looking for help. If we can be the person in our community that starts to recognize these problems and starts to be a resource for other dentists in our community, that's where you start to build a thriving practice. You know, it's interesting, the talk that you guys are going to have next month is the best way to fight DSOs. I'm going to tell you, I think being able to diagnose joints, without a doubt, is the fastest way to bring high quality new patients into your practice who will function outside the insurance system. This really is the best way to insulate your practice, I think, from insurance third party um, management of your practice. Now, the assumption is TMD patients present with pain, but that's not the clinical reality. The clinical reality is that most TMD patients present with malocclusions. We're not used to thinking about this. Again, I'm talking to the American Academy of Craniofacial Pain, so pain is a huge issue. But in a restorative practice, and for most of the people who are listening to this webinar, you're gonna see patients come in with malocclusions that have joint-based problems. The most common is gonna be the class two occlusion. You know, we've kind of danced around this subject for years. I'm gonna say it out loud, the class two occlusion is a joint patient. Now, everyone says the etiology of the class two patient is genetics. If that was the case, we would see normal joint anatomy when we image those class two patients. I've imaged class two patients for the last 30 plus years. With MRI, you do not see normal disc position in the class two patient with, it's the rare exception that you see that. Take a look at this patient. This is Isabella. She's 13 years old, significant class two, and again, a discal displacement. The reason why they're a class two, look at the condyle position. That condyle has moved up. Basically, we've lost vertical dimension at the joint level. When you lose vertical dimension at the joint level, it's a class two bite shift. Now, couple the fact that if the disc comes off in the growing patient, it increases the risk, the risk that the ramus length isn't gonna to grow to full genetic potential. Now we start to understand why we start to see so many class two patients today. This has been talked about in the literature in 2016. Daniel Manfredini from Italy talked about in a systemic review of literature. It's reasonable to suggest that skeletal class two profiles and hyperdivergent growth patterns, which is another name for a short ramus length, are likely associated with an increased frequency of disc displacement and degenerative disorders. This was talked about again almost 20 years ago by Flores Mir out of the University of Alberta. Disc abnormalities associated with reduced forward growth of the maxilla. There's a question on that we'll come to at the end of the presentation as well. And mandibular bodies. It's also associated with reduced downward growth of the mandibular ramus. So we're not getting full development if the disc isn't covering the bone in the growing years. That's why it's the forgotten tissue because we don't look at that in its relationship to growth. We simply think, is it a clicking or popping joint and is the patient sore? How about a candidate occlusal plane? Take a look at Jennifer. Jennifer's 28 years old. She doesn't like her smile. When you look at her occlusion, she's a full class too. Again, I talked about this in 2004. Internal derangements of the TM joint can affect dental facial morphology. Internal derangements appear to be associated with a change in dental morphology, especially at the mandibular ramus. And as we take a look, now we start to see why she has the facial asymmetry and the candid occlusal plane. Take a look at her chin. Her chin is shifted to the right as well. 
She's got the Canada Clusal plane to the right. 52.9 millimeters on the right, 58 on the left. Significant structural lack of development in the right ramus length due to an early injury at the joint level. The forgotten tissue wasn't there to protect the bone as it grew. And as a result now, we think she grew that way. Not the case. She grew that way simply because the disc wasn't there, not because of a genetic, genetic predisposition. When we look at the MRIs, you can see again, the bone doesn't fill two thirds of the joint socket. So we can be pretty sure that that disc came off before growth was complete, early injury, typical, typical case that we see in all our practices every day, really. Let's look at a facial asymmetry. You can see now the chin's pointing to the left. So we suspect the left ramus is gonna be short in this case. And when you take a look, we see significant structural changes in this joint as well. The left condyle is markedly smaller. Again, the right condyle, again, is just about perforated to the, at the lateral pole. We can see a cyst in the left condyle. We can see heterotopic bone growing off the joint socket. So again, all these patients that are presenting in our practice are presenting for one reason, because the forgotten tissue, the disc wasn't there to protect the bone during growth, and it wasn't there to maintain the bone after growth. None of these cases happen if the disc is there. That's the part about the fact that we've forgotten how important that tissue is. When we look at the ramus lengths, again, a 12 millimeter discrepancy looking right to left. The left now is so much shorter, that's why everything was canned to the left. That's why she had the facial asymmetry. Anterior open bites, you know, every dentist has cases in their practice that change the way they think about things. This was one of mine. Now, I misdiagnosed this case when I originally saw it. I thought it was a tongue thrust. In those days, I was hearing a lot about tongue thrust, and I thought that the tongue was opening the bite. I don't believe that happens today, quite frankly. When you start to take a look at the imaging, you start to understand why I changed my thinking. Because ultimately, this patient isn't growing. You've got small bone, you've got eroded bone, you've got a dematous bone. I made three different splints for this patient and none of them were able to reduce the pain levels simply because there was more structural damage that I had anticipated because I made the splints before I imaged. After this case, I didn't make another splint without imaging because I figured I had to know the anatomy that I was trying to influence with the occlusal appliance that I was fabricating. Over jet are the same issues. Take a look at this case. This is a really interesting case because if you look at it, I want you to reverse engineer what happened in this case. This is an overjet case, but what treatment was done? You can see that they extracted the maxillary first premolars. Now, is that in reality what the treatment probably should have been? And I'm gonna say no. I'm gonna ask you to put those premolars back in and now we're going to get a real idea of what the anterior posterior relationship was. And when you start to take a look at it, again, anytime there's an anterior uncoupling greater than the thickness of the disc, what I'm suspecting is we've lost the gasket at the medial pole of the condyle. Here you can see we're just about bone to bone on the right side. The left side here is the compromised joint. Again, you can see the lack of cortical plate with the red arrows. You can see the heterotopic bone growing from the joint socket with the yellow arrow. Again, this, this woman has a lot of issues going on. And unless we get an MRI and a CT, it's awfully hard to have a realistic discussion with her. Posterior wear cases, especially on younger patients like Mary. Mary was 17 years old when I saw her, had just finished ortho was getting ready to go back into a second round of ortho. I said, let's take a closer look at the joints. She said, the problem is my second molar, my tooth in the back, that's the one that's hurting me. And if you look through, she's already worn through her enamel. At 17, she's into the dentin. But take a look at the condyle. That's a really small condyle for someone that age. That bone never grew. And when you take a look at that, what other patient is she? She's an airway patient. Take a look at the lower picture, the picture on the lower left. She's got no pharyngeal airway space. Talk about retronathic patients as another clinical presentation of structurally altered joints. This patient's 10 years old, six months at this initial picture. 
the imaging is taken at 16 years, 10 months. Look at the breakdown in the left condyle. Significant breakdown. Again, look one side to the other side. You can see the control on the right side. Here's the joint that had the structural alterations. The bone didn't grow. The mandible was retronathic. And now when you take a look, we start to see the, the clinical presentations of that. So not only retronathia, how about a high mandibular plane angle case? Take a look at skip. Again, high mandibular plane angle, retronathic mandible. They all start to look the same way, but take a look at how small the condyles are. And now when you take a look at things, we can also call this a vertical grower. We can call it a clockwise grower, but ultimately they're airway patients because they're not able to get far enough out to keep an open pharyngeal airway space. And what happens is the compromised airway, the airway starts to collapse because we simply don't have enough mandibular projection as well as maxillary projection. So let's look at a couple of airway cases because these are really interesting cases. I wanna make this point loud and clear. Soft tissue changes precede hard tissue changes. You don't see these bone changes unless the forgotten tissue isn't there to protect the bone. Really broken down bone in both of these condyles, irregular cortical plates, eroded bone, tough cases. And now when you start to take a look at things, short ramus lengths as well, but again, the same thing we see, the compressed pharyngeal airway space. Let's look at Paula, she's 22. Small condyles, this condyle didn't grow at all. That's supposed to be 20 millimeters on the right side. That's 9.9, .9, so not a lot of bone growth there. 13 on the other side, small air as well. Ramus lengths of 54.6 and 53.4. Again, small ramus lengths, but look at her face. She's got no chin. She's got no chin because she's got no ramus lengths. That's the problem. And when you look at the airway, again, collapsed pharyngeal airway space. How do you feel about making a mandibular advancement device on this patient, given the condition of her joints? I'm gonna say that's, you do that enough, it's gonna be an issue. You know, a good friend of mine, Jeff Rouse, does a lot of airway speaking. He says, I got tired of making appliances because I got tired of seeing joints get sore or bites change. So again, we need to start thinking about how we're gonna address these for more of a long-term solution. Here's John, John's a big guy, John's about 6'5". Again, bad joints on the right side. When you take a look at his ramus length, it's relatively short for a guy his size, but again, He's practically occluded at the pharyngeal airway level simply because he's not able to get far enough out because he's got short ramus lengths. We'll take a look at Sherry. Again, broken down bone because the disc isn't there to protect it. Ramus lengths of 58 and 57, compressed airway space. Last case we'll look at is Lee. Lee, you can practically see her face is collapsed. She's retronathic at the maxilla. She's retronathic at the mandible. She's got compromised joints. You take a look, her surface area on the right joint is 75.5. She's down to 60 millimeters on the left side. Those are really, really compromised joints. And when you start to take a look at her ramus length, she's down to 54 millimeters. And again, no surprise, she's got the compressed pharyngeal airway space. Those things all go together. They all start to become the same patient in these situations. Dadgar wrote this article in 2021 that was our, that was co-authored by David Hatcher that talked about the long face syndrome. Vertical growers in the past were thought to be primarily a genetic posterior growth pattern. More recent studies have shown, though, that the steep mandibular plane and the dolicofacial characteristics, short ramus lengths, at our higher risk for having a joint disorder and altered skeletal morphology. Previous studies indicated that individuals with disc displacements have a higher percentage of skeletal morphology, including decreased ramus on posterior face height and clockwise rotation of the ramus and the mandible. Exactly the thing we just looked at in five of those airway cases. Mandibular growth has been linked to condylar growth. It's reasonable to think that a developmental onset of degenerative joint disease limits airway dimensions. And I guess here's the real change in thinking, because if you listen to the airway world, everything happens in the maxilla. The results from this study indicate if there's been condylar growth disturbance somewhere in the growth cycle, there's a potential change for facial growth to become more vertical and the airway to become more narrower 
secondary to joint change. So finally, we're starting to get some respect for the joint and the role it plays in airway. Because for years, we've known that if the mandible doesn't grow, it impacts the maxilla as well. But if the mandible doesn't grow, the likelihood is we're going to have a compressed pharyngeal airway space. When we talk about airway, generally, I'm looking for blockages, nasal blockage or pharyngeal blockage, pharyngeal blockage. This third blockage here is almost has a high correlation to joints. So things to think about. If the lower jaws are injured early and doesn't grow, the tongue's further away from the maxilla, which makes it more difficult to influence maxillary growth. We're gonna talk about the tongue at the end of the presentation here, and we'll make some comments on it. If the jaw, lower jaw is injured early and doesn't grow, the lack of mandibular projection often impinges on pharyngeal airway. But bottom line is if we have bad joints, we're increasing the likelihood for an airway problem. Ultimately, the clinical reality is airway discussions typically emphasize the maxilla. I'm going to tell you, I don't think you can predictably treat airway problems if, unless we understand both the soft tissue and the hard tissue at the joint level, primarily because it's really difficult to know if we're going to make a mandibular advancing appliance for someone for a sleep problem, if we're going to get back under the disc or we're not going to get back under the disc. Think of all those cases that I just showed you with those crummy condyles. Do you want to be pulling those forward against an incline with no disc protection? I don't think so. So that's why I'm saying if we're going to treat airway, we have to understand joint anatomy and not just hard tissue. We have to understand the soft tissue through MRI as well. The number of hypoplastic maxilla are underestimated and the number of hypoplastic mandibles are underestimated. The number of patients who could benefit from a surgical perspective on both is underestimated. We're dealing with patients, many patients, who have skeletal deformities. And what we're supposed to do is now make a perfect result out of something that really isn't a perfect and anatomic system to build on. The problem is the number of patients who are going to accept a surgical approach is low. So we got to be really clear about this. Not only the dentist, but the patient has to understand that the hypoplastic heart tissue at the maxilla and the mandible may result in compromised treatment outcomes because otherwise we're held responsible for something that quite frankly isn't possible. So again, why do we need to know about the disc? Even if you don't treat pain patients, all, all of us see malocclusions every day that are caused by structural changes at the joint level. These aren't just patients in my practice. These are patients in all our practices. Ultimately, most of these patients present with malocclusions before they hurt, and most malocclusions are a result of a failure to achieve normal or a failure to maintain normal related to TM joint vertical dimension. If we see patients who are class two occlusion, candid occlusal planes, facial asymmetries, anterior open bites, deep bites, overjet cases, tooth wear, gummy smiles, retronathic patients, vertical growers, high mandibular plane cases, airway patients, pain patients, the likelihood is they have a joint component. Let me ask you a question. What percentage of those patients are in your practice? We were told it was five to 10%. I'm gonna tell you it's at least a third to a half. And for the people on this webinar, it's higher because everyone on this webinar is practicing, probably practicing at a higher level than the dentist in your community. If you weren't, you wouldn't be part of this organization and you wouldn't be taking time away from at night to listen to a webinar. So in your practices, that number is gonna be higher because patients who have these needs are gonna seek you out. So we're, we have these all over our practices. So the question is, do all joint patients have malocclusions? And the answer, it depends on the condition of the joint, but more specifically, it depends upon the vertical dimension at the joint level. And really the question is, does the disc maintain the vertical dimension at the medial pole? If it doesn't, then the retrodiscal tissue has to assume that position and maintain it the same as a disc, and that rarely happens. So if the disc comes off, the likelihood is there's gonna be a class two bite shift. The larger the bone, 
breakdown or failure to grow, the larger the class two occlusion. Real easy to think about. How do we talk about joints? Today, we usually talk about joints, whether it's a normal joint, whether it's a disc displacement without reduction, whether that's the clicking joint, a disc displacement without reduction, that's the joint that doesn't click anymore, or a perforated joint. The problem is none of those talk about the disc coverage at the medial pole. So ultimately, we can't assess the risk factors, either malocclusion or pain, in treatment planning. We want to look at a classification system that allow us to look at the disc position at the medial pole. Again, we need to see the forgotten tissue at the medial pole. I'm going to give you three types of joints that we see in practice every day. One is structurally intact. Disc is attached at the lateral pole. Disc is attached at the medial pole. We've got soft tissue coverage, normal joint. Here we have a displacement at the lateral pole. Medial pole's intact, so the Disc is still maintaining the vertical dimension and we can still load. This is part of the confusion because unless we differentiate between lateral pole displacements and medial pole displacements, then we have no idea of which ones are the higher risk ones. I have patients who have been in my practice who've clicked for 25 years and have never had a problem. These are the types of patients. They've got medial pole protection, but they're off on the lateral pole. Now, the last ones are the ones where they're off at the lateral pole and the medial pole. So when we start to take a look at risk profiling, normal joints are, we're, we're able to do anything we want. As a restorative dentist, if I have a normal joint, I know I can build an occlusion that's gonna be rock solid. I'm not worried at all about that. Lateral pole cases, not the load bearing part of the joint, not the part of the joint that maintains the vertical dimension, if the disc is off there, you know what? We're still okay. We've all done work on clicking patients and it's been very stable. They've probably been in this category. Now, the higher risk cases are where we don't have any disc coverage at the medial pole. Those are the yellow red cases. Park Piper is an oral surgeon who's been retired for a while now. Mark developed a Piper a classification system. It's really an easy way to look at this and communicate not only to patients, but to colleagues. Piper stage one or two is going to be normal joints. Piper stage one is completely normal. Piper stage two is beginning breakdown at the ligament at the lateral pole. Intermittent click, not a big deal. 3A is a clicking lateral pole. 3B is a locking lateral pole. The green, yellow reds are the medial poles. If 3A was a clicking lateral pole, 4A is a clicking medial pole. If 3B was a locking lateral pole, 4B is a locking medial pole. And then fives are perforated. 5A is acute, 5B is chronic. And really it's an easy way to be able to talk to your colleagues about this. I've got a Piper 4A, it knows right away what type of joint we're dealing with. Now, I wanna be real clear. This doesn't talk about treatment planning. The yellow reds don't always need surgery. So please don't misunderstand that because that's one of the misconceptions about this uh, classification system. Also, it's not a progressive classification system. Someone could stay a 3A their entire life. People can progress through, but that's not usually the way it is. Usually people stay at one stage and kind of hang out there for a while until something changes. But it gives us a real clear idea of which patients we need additional diagnostic information for, and that's the yellow-red cases. I want to see an MRI to see the soft tissue. I want to see BCT to see the hard tissue. So the green-yellows, they're the lower risk for patients, for dentists, for pain, for bite problems, and for airway issues. We don't need to see imaging for those. The yellow reds, the four A's to five B's, those are the ones we want to see with MRI and CBCT. Those are the deep end of the pool cases, really, if you think about it. So how do these patients present in our practice? They present in two ways, something hurts or something doesn't fit whether that's the bite or the airway, something doesn't fit. And it's almost always due to vertical dimension, either a degeneration after normal growth, but more likely a failure to achieve normal. I really have to tell you over the years, I've become convinced that many of these cases start out early in life, similar to airway patients. The airway world has done a great job at talking about the need to treat early we need to do the same thing in joints as well. 
Many times you have a hypoplastic maxilla and a hypoplastic mandible. Those are the deep end of the pool cases. So let's talk about our treatment options. So our treatment planning options, basically we've got treatment options at the maxillary level and the mandibular level. Now, if we're gonna treat at the maxilla, we're, at the maxillary level, we're generally gonna treat one of two problems. Either it's gonna be a transverse problem or an anterior or posterior problem. If it's a transverse problem, we could do traditional ortho with maxillary tooth expansion and tooth uprighting. We could do surgically facilitated ortho to try and gain some transverse width. We could do a MARPI, we could do a dome, we could do a SARPI procedure. All those will gain transverse width. In order to gain AP width, we can clear out the back, removing tonsils and adenoids. We can do tongue therapy. We can do protraction headgear and ortho. Again, we could do SFOT and try and get some AP correction or we could go with the surgical LaFord procedure. That's pretty much our options on the man maxillary level. On the mandibular level, we've got non-surgical and surgical options. Non-surgical options will be an appliance, physical therapy or chiropractic treatment, pharmacology, and injection therapy. Injection therapy could be Botox, it could be PRF, it could be PRP, it could be any of the different injection techniques that are out today. It could be stellate ganglion blocks, for nerve, uh, sympathetic nerve management. But those are kind of the non-surgical routes. And I guess what I wanna say is those are gonna work for a lot of patients, but let's be honest about it. They're not gonna work for everyone. So at some point we have to have surgical options that we can go to because not everyone is gonna respond to conservative therapy. That's the reality that I, you know, I hear people say, oh, the joint stabilized and everything got better. Okay, that happens in some patients, but it doesn't happen in every patient, quite frankly, and it doesn't happen in a lot of patients. So we've got soft tissue options from a surgical perspective. We can do an arthrocentesis where we flush the joints, an arthroscopy, we put a camera in and we take a look around, a disc repair where you put the disc back on top of the bone, or a disc replacement where we take the disc out and substitute it typically with abdominal fat. If we've got heart tissue compromise, typically small condyles, we could reinforce with a rib or more likely today you do a total joint. So those are all your options. And then we get to the tooth level. And then it's really easy. It's basically reshaping or equilibrating. It's repositioning with orthodontics. It's restoring either indirect or direct restorations or it's resecting with a mandibular advancement. I mean, basically, if you really think about it, pretty much all our options are on this slide. There may be a couple other ones that may fit into some tertiary treatment options, but for the most part, this is what we're generally doing. Now, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the mandibular options at the joint level. Phase one options, basically what we're doing with an appliance, physical therapy or chiropractic treatment, medications or injections, we're changing joint loading and we're hoping for adaptation at the joint level. We can do this at any piper stage. And if the anatomy isn't bad, these work really well. You can have a displaced disc, but if you have good bone dimension and you don't have a big thick disc out in front of the bone, these patients get better pretty quickly. Phase two options, we're changing in joint anatomy at the joint level, and we're hoping for adaptation. Now, when do you think about doing this is the arthrocentesis? In my experience, I've had a lot of patients go for arthrocentesis. Basically, it's flushing the joint. I'm not sure what that's bringing to the table from a treatment perspective. I don't see a lot of people having long-term success with this. And arthroscopy is another option. Again, today with three-dimensional imaging, we really don't need to go into the joint to see it. We can see it just as well with imaging. A disc repair is the only option that can restore us to normal anatomy. So for that reason, it has a unique advantage, but here's the problem. The problem is if the disc isn't in the right position, it doesn't get compressed and get synovial fluid compression into it for lubrication. So basically it starts to dry out. It goes from a, di from a grape to a raisin. And then you can't repair it because it doesn't fit. So if we're gonna talk about disc repairs, it's generally gonna be in younger patients. By the time patients are out of their teens, 
into their early 20s, it's getting towards the end of the window for disc repairs. If we can't repair, we can replace. Abdominal fat has been a remarkably consistent grafting material for 25 years now. I get a little bit frustrated when I hear people say fat doesn't work. That means they haven't done enough cases or they haven't followed the post-op protocol afterwards. You do have to protect the fat just like you would a gingival graft. You can't go home and have the patient brush the same day because you have to establish a vascularity in the graft. It's the same thing with fat. The problem is it's about a six month period. So the patient has to understand that we're gonna have a controlled occlusion through a bite appliance for six months and you're gonna be on a soft diet. If they do that, I will tell you, it's one of the most predictable procedures we have. The problem is when you have small bone, because again, when you have small bone, it's like wearing high heel shoes in wet grass. It just moves through the soft material. From the heart tissue perspective, again, we can reinforce with the rib. We don't do that as much anymore today simply because we've got better artificial joints that we're building with. So those are basically our soft tissue options at the joint level. Now, the question is, these are gonna be done generally in Piper fours and fives. There's really no reason for a green or a green yellow case, a Piper one to three B to even consider these. These are gonna be the yellow red cases. So what do we see on the imaging that's gonna increase the need for this? A large 11 o'clock disc is one high risk presentation. You've got a small bone there. You've got a big disc. It's like a doorstop wedged in there where you can't get past it. A lot of times difficult opening. These are tough cases, very tough cases. These are the cases where if you build a real tight anterior guides, the patient goes crazy because they're already locked in at the back end. If we lock them in at the front end, they're the ones that come in and says, you got to fix my bite. You got to fix my bite. I'm hitting too, too much on the front teeth. Eroded bone cases are tough cases. Again, eroded bone, we can start with appliance therapy. Generally, I'll give them anywhere from six to 12 months and I'll take a new CT scan to see how they look. A lot of times they're looking pretty good. I had one today where we lost some bone. So I always tell patients with appliance therapy, one of three things will happen. You'll get better, you'll get worse, you'll stay the same. And I think that's, a real, that's, I think that's the real world and patients need to understand that. Edematous bone are hard cases as well when we've got circulation problems inside the cort or inside the marrow space. <clears throat> we also have small bones. Small bones are tough cases because generally they don't project well. So we've got retronathic mandibles and maxillas, and there's just not enough bone there to carry the load. That's why they're tough cases. Short ramus lengths are the same way. Neurogenic pain from sympathetically mediated pain. We could do a whole webinar on that. Again, we're doing a lot of work with nerve blocks these days, but it's very effective with this type of pain. And ultimately, airway anatomy is going to influence our surgical procedures today, especially. And I'm going to show you a case in just a couple of minutes that talks about airway in this type of situation. So when should we think about joint surgery? Basically three times. If we can't get them comfortable with phase one, for me, I'm going to start thinking about a disc replacement procedure. The reason I'm saying that is because I've had such good luck with fat over the years, as long as we follow the protocol. The second is hypoplastic condyles. When you've got really small bone, that's it again, when you're gonna start thinking about joint replacements. And lastly is growing patients. You know, I gotta tell you, if we can get the disc back on top of the bone and get growth, it's the most valuable thing we can do for a patient. And you're starting to see a lot of discussion now in the literature, this was in 2020, that um, unilateral juvenile anterior disc dysplasia should be treated as early as possible with the repositioning of the disc to improve condylar development and avoid jaw deformities. For years, surgery has been really kind of been beat up on. It's nice to see now that we're starting to see some articles in the literature that are coming the other way. Disc repositioning combined with postoperative functional splints can effectively promote condylar growth and help correct dental deformities. And basically, here's the, here's the really sobering statement. Conservative therapy for displaced discs in a class two occlusion in growing patients can cause condylar resorption and aggravate the dental facial deformity. It's not enough now just simply to watch it because what we're doing, it's supervised neglect. We're watching it break down. The jaw joint is the only joint we watch not develop and don't do anything about it. Again, this was written in 2018 um, in the Journal of Cranial 
maxillary facial surgery. So we talked about our treatment planning options. And again, I just wanted to show you everything on one slide so we can look at it. As we look at phase three, that's basically the teeth. Once we've got the upper and lower jaw stabilized, we can use facially generated treatment planning that Frank Spear talked about in 1986. And we can use equilibration, orthodontic treatment, restorative treatment, or orthognathic treatment. We're gonna change the tooth position or condition, and we're gonna hope for adaptation at the tooth level. Really easy, basically, when you think about it in terms of the workflow. And again, we'll do any Piper stage for this as well. So let's look at a case study before we call it a night. Here's Gina, she's 29 years old. Brian Shaw and I, Brian Shaw took over from Mark Piper. Brian and I work a lot together. Fabulous oral surgeon in St. Petersburg, Florida. And when you take a look, Gina's retronathic at 29. She's already had orthodontic treatment, so she's had arch development. Here she is in maximum intercuspation, retronathic maxilla, retronathic mandible. She had ortho from ages 12 to 14 doing an overbite. We already talked about this. If it's an overbite, you got to start thinking that it's a joint-based issue. Now, when we take a look at her joints in a skeletal position, you'll notice I didn't say CR. I said a fully seated condylar position. CR means you've got a disc. It's a healthy joint. This isn't a healthy joint, but this is a skeletal position, which I really think we need to evaluate the bite in. If we just looked at her in maximum intercuspation, we would have missed the defect. So take a look at your patients in a skeletal position. Forget the CR stuff. That's not what we're talking about. It's a skeletal position to see if the anterior teeth are uncoupled greater than the thickness of the disc. Because if that's the case, we're thinking that we've lost the vertical dimension holding contact at the joint level. So we diagnosed her as a yellow red case. Now she had a typical treatment that you might expect with this growing up. She had orthodontics, <clears throat> she had an occlusal appliance, but none of that was helping. So there she went to a disc replacement, but that still didn't treat the AP problem. So eventually she ended up with a Lafort and a resection for the mandibular advancement. So here she is preoperatively. Again, her teeth don't fit together. Her, you can see that a skeletal base is really distorted. 49 millimeter ramus length on the right side, 42 on the left, really short. And now you can see the anterior uncoupling with the small bone. Again, this bone wouldn't look like this if the disc was on top of it. The forgotten tissue wasn't there to protect the bone. So here she is post-op preoperatively, and now we can see her post-operatively. She had a LaFord procedure with the maxillary, she had a mandibular advancement, as well as a chin implant. Now we've got an occlusion that's gonna work for her. And you can see now she's put together, we certainly have a better airway anatomy. As we start to look now, we've got mandibular projection, so we're gonna have an airway now that goes preoperatively to postoperatively with a huge change. So again, it starts to underscore the importance of mandibular projection and maxillary projection and having the hypoplastic mandible and the hypoplastic maxilla in the right place so we can develop an airway dimension. But the problem with this case is we're relying on awfully compromised joints to hold this. Now, if we have to, we can always go back in and replace the joints. And since she's only 29 years old, what other orthopedic joint in the body do you know that has artificial joints at age 29? You don't see knees going at 25. So what we're trying to do is to push an artificial joint as far down the road as we can. If we can get support at the bite level, we may be able to do that pretty effectively. So let's make some closing comments, then we'll do a little Q&A. Temporomandibular joint patients typically present with altered anatomy. We were told that they used to be just muscle cases. My belief today is I think what happens is, is you, you're starting to see these way earlier in life. And basically what we're seeing now is these patients coming in, not just with muscle problems, but with joint problems as well. Joint problems typically present with a chief concern of pain, something hurts, or malocclusion, compressed airway anatomy, something doesn't fit. If the disc is in the correct position, it's uncommon for a patient to have joint pain and uncommon for a class two occlusion. The disc is ignored because some patients click and pop and don't have pain. 
The assumption is that people who click and pop generally don't have pain. The disc is ignored in growing patients because we believe the etiology of the class two occlusion is genetics. Genetics is definitely gonna influence facial development, but the disc influences how the teeth fit together. Since the disc is the forgotten tissue, many times when we get imaging, we limit our diagnostic imaging to CBCT scans. In order to help patients understand their options, it's important if we can understand both the hard and the soft tissue anatomy. So I'm gonna suggest considering, consider obtaining a CBCT image to assess hard tissue and think about getting an MRI to see the soft tissue, especially in growing patients. And with that, we have some questions from a previous webinar, but let's attack these first questions first. So we have some questions here. I'm gonna start with the first one. In regards to disc repair, what rehab protocols post-op do you implement? Is there a full-time stabilization splint to all healing in your practice? Yes, because what we want to do is basically we want to center the condyle right in the middle of the disc. Now, in order to do a disc repair, we have to look at the MRI and make sure that where we're going to build the occlusion, we can get the disc back on top of the bone. So that means that we're gonna take the MRI in multiple positions, fully seated, maximum intercuspation, incise a ledge or class one in a growing patient, and fully in a translated position. If that's the case, if the disc doesn't get back on top of the bone until they're way open, that's not a disc repair case. The disc can't be too far forward because we can't pull it all the way back and suture to the condyle. So again, we have to get this relatively early. But if we do get that, then many times it is a stable procedure. Um, have you often seen alterations to the opposite joint when one is grafted with fat? You know, it's interesting because most of the time, if one side needs fat, the other side has problems also. So if that's the case, we may think about doing both joints. We try and do only one joint if we can, but if there's any doubt, we'll generally do both joints. So is phase three treatment necessary if symptoms resolve after phase two? No. If I can get com patients comfortable after phase two treatment, um, either with conservative therapy or surgical therapy, I'm fine with that. As long as the bite works and from a restorative perspective, they don't need any work that we have to rebuild the occlusion for. But no, if they're comfortable, I don't necessarily have to go any further. When I was a younger dentist, I thought I had to do that. Today, if they're comfortable, I'm going to leave them there and say, we're going to consider you adapted until you prove us otherwise. And we're going to celebrate the victories of phase one and phase two treatment. So we're going to leave them right there. Um, have I found a use for a Lewandowski logic articulator to construct a splint for lowering the condyle in the fossa? Um, Yes, I, I've not used a Lewandowski one, but I have used a SAM NPV. But if I'm guessing what the Lewandowski logic articulator is, it's a way you can alter the condylar position. The way we'll do that is to look at the imaging and see how many millimeters we are from normal, either horizontally or vertically, and we can adjust for that. Yes, I think that's a great way to do it. But again, today, what we're seeing as we move to the digital world we can do a lot of that in the digital format as well. Okay, um, it seems that the CBCT is crucial. How do we position the bite for accurate imaging? Great question. When you image with a CBCT, simply seat the joints. Doesn't matter how you do it, and it doesn't have to be pinpoint accurate. You're just getting a skeletal registration. You can use by manual, you can use a leaf gauge, you can use an anterior deprogrammer. Most dentists use what they learn first. I first learned occlusion from Pete Dawson, so I use by manual. If you heard John Coyce, you probably use an anterior deprogrammer. 
If you heard Frank Spear, you probably use a leaf gauge. Doesn't matter. All you're trying to do is to get the condyles in a superior position so you can evaluate if we think the disc is there or if it's not there. Now, the question is, the CBCT crucial? Yes, but I'm going to tell you, I think the MRI is just as crucial. And I get a lot of pushback on that, and I don't understand it. I think really that's why I titled the program tonight The Forgotten Tissue, because I think we really need to take a closer look at the disc as we're going through this. Okay, next question. We take the MRI in two positions based on openings. What's the benefit of four positions? Great question. Basically, we're looking to see where the condyle, what the condyle disc assembly is in those four positions. If the condyle is covering the disc at the medial pole and fully seated, we can build it there. We don't have to build it there. I like using fully seated for one of two reasons. If I need maximum load distribution or if I want maximum occlusal stability. Those are generally the two reasons I'll use a fully seated position. Now, if I've got the disc there, I'm 100% confident as a restorative dentist, I can do a really good job. So that's why I'm looking at the first two. The third one is gonna be the incisal edge in the adult or the class one canine in the growing patient. Because in the growing patient, I wanna see if I can get under the disc at a class one. If I can, I have a good chance at maybe using a functional appliance and maybe getting some condylar growth. Or if I can do that, I might be able to repair the disc as well. And then lastly, the open is we wanna see if it's gonna get back underneath there in maximum opening. We have a local surgeon that does disc repairs even if the disc is fully displaced. You can do it if it's fully displaced. My preference would be that it would be a 12 o'clock or an 11 o'clock disc where it's not really far forward. So that's okay. The real thing is, does the soft tissue and the hard tissue still fit each other? If that disc is crumpled up and the grape has gone to a raisin, that's gonna be a hard repair to have a long-term success. How do you stabilize post-op surgically? Same thing, we're gonna use an appliance that's gonna maintain the condyle right on in the middle of that disc repair, and we're gonna let that heal. But it's not the procedure, it's the case selection that dictates the success of a disc repair. We have to pick the right cases. If we don't pick the right cases, it doesn't matter how well the disc repair is done, the disc isn't gonna stabilize. Sorry for all the questions, nothing to be sorry about. I'm glad they're coming through here. 22 year old female, just diagnosed with an anterior disc displacement without reduction. She has right posterior open by an anterior edge to edge. Okay, so I'm gonna guess, let's work through this. 22 year old female, anterior disc displacement without reduction. I'm gonna make the assumption that that's at the medial pole. So I'm gonna make the assumption we've lost the disc probably in the left joint because if the right has a posterior open bite, it means everything's shifted to the left. So I would be suspicious, suspicious of the left joint there. And an anterior edge to edge, which means they're probably a class one or maybe even a class three, and everything has shifted to the left. The treatment plan would be based upon the imaging. And really, again, if they're not having any problems, I'm not doing anything. If they don't have any pain, and if they're not tearing up their mouth, if they're not breaking teeth, if they're not wearing teeth, I'm gonna leave it the way it is. It may be an aesthetic problem, and then we can talk about treatment options, but if they're not having any problems, then I don't think you have to worry about it. If they are having problems, then we simply go through the treatment options. Probably start with a phase one appliance and a, a splint, and then see what happens from there. But again, what we're looking for when we do the imaging are those high risk anatomic conditions that decrease the prognosis of a successful appliance therapy. Small bone, eroded bone, edematous bone, a large 11 o'clock disc, short ramus length, uh, neurogenic pain, airway, compressed airway anatomy. 
Those are all the things that would make us think that we may have to do something else. But typically in that case, we'll start with phase one and then we'll move forward from there. Okay, next question. How do you feel about the pseudo disc concept when there's provision for dental support of the joint? A natural regeneration. You know what? I don't like the term pseudo disc because I think it implies a false sense of security. I would prefer the term as adapted retrodiscal tissue. My belief is that retrodiscal tissue is not a pain source. We used to think that impinging on highly innervated retrodiscal tissue caused pain. I don't think that's true. Think how many patients in your practice function on retrodiscal tissue. A lot. The pain's not coming from retrodiscal tissue. That was before we had imaging, and the only other pain source we thought was muscle. And if the splint didn't work, there had to be a reason why, and the retrodiscal tissue became the reason. That's not highly innervated tissue. It's a vascular shunt is what it is. And it simply accounts for the change in volume as we open and close. So I think when we think about that, it's simply retrodiscal tissue that's adapted. But I don't like the term pseudo disc, so that's why I don't use that. Regarding MRIs, poor medical facilities in Canada. Uh, you know, I, I Michelle Camo is a good buddy of mine in Nova Scotia. I went out to Nova Scotia for seven years and ran a study club for Michelle. I know Canada is tough with MRIs, but here's my suggestion. Go to a private imaging center. Almost every city that I've worked with in Canada can find a private imaging center. Patient has to be able to pay for it, but if we can create the value for that, it's a hard sell because I know patients are used to having things covered by insurance. But my experience is that these patients want two things. They want answers and they want options. If they want that, the MRI is where the answers are and it, it allows us to have a realistic discussion about your treatment options. Now, there's an old saying, if you say no to one thing, you say yes to another. So if you say no to an MRI, then to say yes to guessing at what the treatment options are gonna be. So depends on how quickly they wanna be treated. If they wanna be treated quickly with a full diagnostic protocol, then they have to figure out a way to get an MRI. If they're not gonna do that and they're willing to guess the patient, then you can just go ahead and do the way we've normally done. When I put it that way to patients, most patients aren't willing to guess. So most patients figure out a way to do it. Next question, have you witnessed condyle remodeling in a significant portion of your patients with splint therapy alone? Um, yes, I have actually. Uh, mostly for the positive. Like I said, today I saw one for the negative, but a lot of times if I've got uh, an eroded cortical plate, I'm seeing that cortical plate recalcify after approximately 12 months of appliance therapy. My appliance is typically a flat plane appliance that they wear sleeping, driving, and exercising. I love a flat plane appliance. I generally don't do repositioning appliances because my patient base usually doesn't have a disc protecting the bone in the, in the advanced position. So that's why I don't advance them most of the time. I understood your comments on form resources too, but don't understand the logic. Do we have any other courses or opportunities to learn from you? Um, you know what, uh, Priya, send me an email and I'll send you some information and we can talk about it then so we can keep going here. Follow up on retrodiscal tissue. If pain's not from retrodiscal tissue, why do we see a fusion in the MRI in that area? We do see it, but not as much as we make out. But a fusion is simply an increase in um, fluid in the area. It doesn't necessarily mean that's painful tissue. Inside the bone, it correlates to pain because that's swelling in the marrow space. But again, I just, I'm not, I'm not convinced the retrodiscal tissue argument holds water today. Um, oops, the poshing related to the imaging position. The imaging position. Oh, I, I think I understand what you're saying, Pat. The imaging, you, we're going to take bite records that are basically uh, bite records one in a seated position, maximum intercuspation, they'll just go in and close down on. In size, a ledger class one will build a bite position, a bite tab there, and then open. So basically, we're giving them four bite records to you, three bite records to use, 
when they go get their imaging. And that's what's going to position the condyle there. So yeah, I'm not going to re- I'm not going to rely on them to do that. I'm going to position that condyle at the diagnostic records appointment. What's the function of the chiropractor and TMJ patient? You know what? I, I usually use chiropractors for upper cervical. I don't use chiropractors a lot for for jaw joints. Um, upper cervical, I think they have a great role in that, and I see a lot of patients with upper cervical. So that's usually what I'll do for that. Okay, that's the questions for tonight. Let me go back to the questions from a previous webinar. Have you noticed bone marrow is in the hips related to hormonal involvement? Um, Are you aware of looking at a study looking at bone marrow edema and TMJ? There's a lot of studies looking at bone marrow edema and TMJ. Larnheim is a author that's written quite a bit on that. Sato has written on that. Again, whoever, this is from last time. I don't know if you're on tonight. If you email me that, I can send you some articles. I don't have a solid uh, understanding of the hormonal involvement in bone marrow at the joint level. So I can't comment on that. Can I explain how disc instability affects growth in the maxilla when the other part is the part on the temporal bone? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I think if we have normal growth, We have normal digital uh, interdigitation of the teeth. And as things grow, we kind of pull each other forward, the mandible and the maxilla. If the mandible isn't growing and the teeth don't couple, there's no forward movement on the maxilla by the mandible to help promote the growth. I think that's the easiest way to think about it. We've been far too segmented in thoughts of our maxilla versus mandible. It works as a system. It grows as a system. If one's not growing, the other wasn't growing. Now, I'm perfectly biased, and I'll admit that, because my training has been highly mandibular-based, so I will say that right off the bat. But I will tell you that if the lower jaw isn't growing, typically what happens is the mandible can't couple, so there's nothing to keep the maxilla from collapsing in and teeth retroclining. And that's exactly what we see. So I think it's because they're not growing as a unit is why the maxilla doesn't grow. What's my opinion on orthodontic extractions on potential TMD and OSA? If we need orthodontic extractions, we already have TMD. There's no reason we should have to extract premolars unless the upper and lower jaws aren't growing. If the upper and lower jaws aren't growing well, we have an increased chance for having obstructive sleep apnea as well. So I don't think the extractions cause the TMD or the OSA. I think we probably have that before. And what the orthodontic extractions are doing is basically trying to get the teeth to a class one relationship. Because we were taught that if you get a class one relationship, you win the game. The problem is it's a different game today. That was the dental occlusion game 25 years ago. Today, it's the airway game, it's the joint game. We can do the premolar extraction and win the dental occlusion game, but we lose the airway game, we lose the joint game. So it's a different game we're playing today. That's why I think we have to think about it differently. How long does a child have compromised joints before growth patterns are changed? Great question. I don't have a solid answer for that. My reactionary answer would be less time than we think. Those bones are growing and that disc, I think of the disc as the growth center between the condyle and the, or the, I think of the growth center of the, of the jaw is basically the interface between the condyle and the disc. If that's off, I think that's where we start to see problems. The longer it's off, the more problems we see. If a patient comes in with a gummy smile and TMD, how do you treat them differently? I don't, I just run them through the same protocol that we talked about. The gummy smile occurs because the mandible isn't out far enough to provide a holding contact for the upper anterior teeth, and they just keep erupting down. That's why you see so many deep bites and gummy smiles in those types of cases. Should we do orthodontic treatment in condyles that are eroded? I would probably want to get an intact cortical plate before I was doing a lot of ortho, because I don't know where I'm going to end up orthodontically. So I would probably try to defer the ortho or just do arch development. But if you've got an eroded condyle, 
that means you're going to have a loss of dimension of the joint level. So that means as an orthodontist, that gets back to the question about the extractions. How am I going to get the anterior teeth to couple if I'm not projecting out far enough? Because we used to think that we have to get everything to couple. I'm going to tell you today, I tell my orthodontist to leave the bite open because I don't want to put those teeth in a position they're not supposed to be. I'd rather have them in their normal position and work with the anterior open bite. Because once I start torquing these teeth back and retroclining these teeth, that's a horrible occlusion to live with, especially if you're 16 years old and just out of ortho. So I'd rather leave it open and manage it with an appliance. Do I believe airway affects the growth of the mandible? I find some correlation with nasal and maxillary deficiencies. Okay, I'm going to show my bias again. I'm going to think that the lack of growth of the mandible influences the airway. I have a difficult time seeing it the other way around. I understand the fact that uh, there's a lot of talk about maxillary deficiencies, and I guess I'm gonna I'm gonna go a little rogue here too. I'm gonna say something that's probably not gonna sit well. I'm not sure that the tongue plays the role that we think it does in maxillary development. I'm not positive that the tongue is plastered against the roof of the mouth all day long. I ask a lot of patients where their tongue is, patients who have well-developed maxillary arches. It's not plastered up against the arch all day long. A lot of times it's at the level of the occlusal plane. So I'm not sure we understand maxillary growth as well as we understand mandibular growth. Let me put it a different way. I'm not sure we understand deficient maxillary growth as well as we understand deficient mandibular growth. But I believe honestly that if the lower jaw isn't growing, that's what sets up a lot of these airway patients that we see. Uh, okay, let's take a look. Couple more uh, questions here. Do I personally manipulate the joint to reduce the disc and restore range of motion? Um, I can try to reduce the disc and get it back underneath the condyle, back underneath the disc, but in my experience, it doesn't stay because the reason the disc is forward is that the ligaments are torn. So that's why I'm not real confident that I can reduce the disc through manipulation. I tried to do that for years and I just, it just doesn't work for me. So when I image, that's why. Uh, Dr. Ramirez was AACP, establishes airway first and watches the bone grow. There's a video on YouTube where he does that, totally understand. But I'm going to tell you now, if the disc isn't on the condyle, it's likely not growing airway irregardless. So again, the forgotten tissue has to be evaluated. It's not just an airway discussion. It's a joint discussion as well. Um, how do I quantify rehab, full-time splint therapy, split test? Oh, it's complete. Um, if, it's, if I'm... If I, um, generally, splint therapy is done when they don't have pain and their bite's not changing. So that's usually the way I'm thinking about it. Um, I give them six to 12 months, and if that's the case, then we'll just leave it there and we'll, um, if they're stable, we'll treat them there. If they'll not, then I'll say, I'll treat you as long as you want with phase one therapy. When you're, willing, when you're ready to go to something else at the joint level, you let me know and we'll talk then. Um, Lastly, a uh, really excellent review, open-minded, but evidence-based. Thank you very much, thought-provoking, which it's all about. Um, thank you. Um, I think, oh, here we go. We got one more. How does it happen a condyle doesn't grow in the first place? That's one of Ramirez's cases. The disc isn't covering the bone. You know, we try to make it about everything else. If a condyle doesn't grow, the disc isn't covering the bone. I, you know, I've imaged for years. I just don't see growth problems if the disc is covering the bone. And conversely, I don't see growth problems. Yeah, if the disc isn't covering the bone, I would say. And if the disc is covering the bone, we have normal growth. So I don't see bone problems if the disc is covering the bone. So that's why I'm thinking that's the issue. So with that, we're running a little bit late. I'm keeping everyone too late on a school night. So I'm going to throw it back to Shay. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. McKee. I think I always tell you your webinars are, are very popular. And I think all the questions just show 
how much people appreciate you being here and, and your knowledge. So thank you again. Thank you for taking the lead on the question so I don't pronounce everything wrong. <laughs> really appreciate that. Um, no problem, Shay. <laughs> and thank you to everyone for joining. Thanks again, Dr. McKee. And I hope everyone has a great night. Thanks again, everyone. Appreciate it. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.